Hello, and welcome to a laureate discussion at the 8th Heidelberg Laureate Forum. It's my tremendous pleasure to be here together with Leslie Lamport and Whitfield Diffie, both of whom have won the ACM AM Touring Award. Leslie Lamport received it uh, for the 2013 award, mostly for his work in concurrency. Now, if you've ever bought anything online and done an auction where you were sitting in San Francisco and somebody else was bidding in Tokyo and the auction was happening in Heidelberg, then you have used his work. He's best known for things like the Paxos algorithm and the bakery algorithm, but he also has a side project that many other people know, which is LaTeX. And I expect that many of the young researchers have used LaTeX. The other person I'm sitting with today is Whitfield Diffie, who received the 2015 ACM AM Turing Award. Uh, he uh, received it for his work in cryptography together with Martin Hellman. And you might know the, Hel the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange. If you've ever sent something online, if you've ever been to a website where you've seen the little key in the corner, then you know his work as well. My name is Tom Geller, I'm a journalist, and I had the tremendous privilege of interviewing both of them when they first received their ACM AM Touring Awards. They've known each other for years, uh, so I'm actually not going to jump in very much uh, as we speak here. Uh, I do have uh, an iPad right here, and so we can take questions as we go. And as they fit into the conversation, please make them relevant to the discussion. Uh, I, will, I will bring them up. I believe that is it. So I will throw it over to you by asking, uh, we're sort of throwing out a theme, which is that of proof. Now, both of, uh, both of you have created algorithms that have been not only useful, but have been provably correct. And so I'd like to, to uh, start with you, perhaps, to talk about how that's so. Well, I remember the first uh, thing I, time I heard about the idea of proving correctness of a program or an algorithm was when Witt told me sometime in the early 70s that he was working under uh, John McCarthy to do that. And that seemed like a pretty silly idea to me. So, Witt, could you explain why you got into that? Well, for one thing, both of us, in effect, are, are in a group of people who is probably declining. What we both thought of ourselves as mathematicians and came to computer science. And the opening of a great mathematical treatise uh, of the 20th century, uh, by a, a fictitious mathematician named Nicolas Bourbaki, uh, is de puis les Grecs, qui dit mathématique, dit démonstration. Ever since the Greeks, whoever speaks of mathematics speaks of proof. And that is, I, I, I think that may be the third most important, mathematics may be the third most important discovery in human history. The, the Egyptians, who did all sorts of wonderful engineering, had empirical mathematics, right? And so if, you know, if, if, if they had known the Pythagorean theorem, which as far as I can tell they didn't, but had they known it, the Egyptian Advanced Research Projects Agency might have sent out people to measure triangles, you know, tens of 20 miles on a side and Maybe they would have discovered the microscope measuring little tiny triangles. And what mathematics has done for human thinking is to, it's an economic thing. It saves a tremendous amount because there are certain things, typically assumptions, that you have to verify empirically. And then we've discovered you can have very good, cons very good confidence in conclusions drawn from those assumptions. So at any event, if one of these, you know, persons who thought mathematically who came into computer science, um, my conclusion was that we didn't know how to program. And in fact, my views were somewhat different from those of, of, of John McCarthy, with whom I went to work. He was someone who understood that proof of correctness was important. but. My real objective would now be called programming methodology. I thought the critical thing was to organize programs so that you could prove them correct. And 
that's uh, sort of how I got into it. Well, that's interesting because uh, you spoke about computer science and in 1970 or whenever it was, I didn't even know there was such a thing. Okay, program. And so I thought that, well, no, there's a, there's a big difference between computer science and programming. It's the difference between science and engineering. And I was actually recently uh, reminded of that in some of the early work of uh, Edgar Dijkstra, uh, a an fantastically important uh, computer scientist who died about 10 years ago. Uh, no, it's longer than that, uh, 20 years ago. But he was the first one that I can remember actually publishing correctness proof of an algorithm. And I had the pleasure of being involved in a paper that uh, he wrote, and I was added as an author because I made some tiny contribution. And the first version of that paper had an incorrect algorithm. And the bug in the algorithm was such that uh, it would almost certainly never have occurred in practice. I mean, it required such a convoluted uh, sequence of events. But that was irrelevant because we were doing computer science. A programmer would have simply ignored that, but a scientist wouldn't, uh, or a mathematician wouldn't, because correctness of an algorithm is a theorem, and a theorem isn't a theorem if it has a counterexample. So, did that sort of thinking involve, get, involve, get you into it? Well, I got, I mean, you say a programmer would have. I think a programmer we particularly knew particularly well, Roland Lazarus Silver, would not have done that. He understood that no matter how convoluted a case, he would have sat there and worried about it. But one of the interesting things is that I ultimately moved not from this motivation into the general field of security. And in security, exceedingly obscure bugs are incredibly important because unlike these circumstances, for example, like the, the Intel divide bug, or if you're doing scientific computation, it's never going to occur. If you have security critical parts of a program and they have bugs in them, the opponents will work to, to get them to exercise those bugs. And so, you know, every, I, I'm agreeing with you, every last detail of something has to be correct. Well, for me, that realization came when I started working on concurrent algorithms. Originally, I got into concurrent algorithms because I liked little programming algorithms, little programming problems. And the problems that were raised in concurrent programs were just more difficult, you know, harder to solve. So I thought that was really cool. And the first time I tried to write a concurrent algorithm, it was a mutual exclusion algorithm. And I had read a seed of mutual exclusion algorithm in the paper, in a, a paper that was published. And I said, oh, that doesn't sound like such a tough problem. I can do better than that. And so I whipped off a little algorithm and sent it to the uh, uh, CACM, communications of the ACM. And I got back two weeks later uh, a letter from the editor pointing out the bug in my algorithm. And that got me really mad at myself. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to solve that problem. And I did. I came up with the bakery algorithm. <laughs> but I also learned the importance of writing a proof. And more recently, uh, especially dealing with distributed algorithms, this has taken on a more practical aspect in the sense that what smart engineers now say that if there's a bug in a, a distributed algorithm, and no matter you know, how improbable it may seem, uh, it's not a question of whether it will appear, it's a question of uh, when it will appear. So 
a different uh, route, but also the same goal of, uh, some sense, perfection. Yeah, well, there's a, you know, there's a saying that New York is a city in which one in a million things happen to eight people a day. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we do, we, when you run, a running trillions of instructions every second around the world, running a lot of the same algorithms, you give them a lot of chance to find the bugs, even without thinky uh, intruders who are trying to push them in that direction. Well, yeah, but now this raises a question uh, about proof. We seem to think that proof is an absolute uh, um, thing. There's, you know, mathematicians write a proof and they've proven it, it's correct. Well, rather long after I started writing proofs, I discovered how bad mathematicians are at writing them. Hmm. There's, uh, I have some, a small amount of uh, somewhat anecdotal evidence <laughs> that indicates that roughly one-third of all published referees mathema uh, refereed mathematical papers contain an incorrect theorem. So, have you worried about not just writing the proofs, but how do you make sure that your proofs are right? Well, actually, that's what I spent a lot of my early career uh, worrying about. Uh, I, I, wrote, I wrote a formal proof checker, and our notion was to have formal proofs of the correctness of programs, and the proofs had to be passed, had to pass being checked by the proof checker. And that notion has been in proof of correctness since its beginning. Um, the, the proofs in question were not the sort of informal proofs that appear in the, in the journals, uh, but fully formal uh, proofs. And one of the problems of the field was that the size of the proofs grew to a point where you couldn't it wasn't a matter of doing them by hand and then checking them by machine. They basically had to be done by machine, and all of it has improved. It, it hasn't gotten to where it's a practical day-to-day -day programming tool for most people. Well, I'm amazed. I never knew that you worked on uh, writing a theorem prover. Can you say a little bit about it? When, uh, when was that? And, uh, uh, 1970. And how good was it? What did it prove? It didn't prove things. It checked uh, proofs. Well, ch okay. There really is a difference. And uh. theorem proving is much harder than checking proofs. And this, this had a, you know, it, it, it checked that every, uh, every use of a rule of inference was applied correctly. Well, in a sense, well, if it's really a proof checker, that is, what you do is you write your proofs at the level of the fundamental axioms and the fundamental proof rules of logic, then those proofs are going to be awfully hard to write and uh, right. will be awfully That's long. Exactly. <laughs> so John McCarthy had published a, 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 a seven-page proof of a very elementary compiler that compiled arithmetic expressions. And I formalized his proof, and it was several hundred lines. And this is incredibly right. This compiler understood one, two, and three, and it understood A, B, and C, and it, it was something guaranteed that expressions like A plus three were going to turn into the correct set of instructions. And hundreds of lines to prove the correctness of this silly little thing. What was it going to be if we had a real, a real program? Actually, I'm amazed that you could, uh, in only 700 lines back in 1970, could prove the correctness of something that one could not laughably call a compiler, even if it was a very simple one. Well, that's my recollection, and probably the evidence is in the online archives of the AI lab, oh. where everybody, everybody, our disk as of that, about that period now all appears on the, on the web. So you can look up potentially embarrassing old things that we uh, put in files 
on our on our discs. Is this an appropriate time for you to plug TLA Plus? Uh, <laughs> well, it would take me a while to get there. Uh, the thing I was about to say is that uh, Witt said that he was talking about proof checkers, not you know, theorem provers. But in practice, the line between the two is, uh, well, I mean, there's a line, but it's a rather fuzzy one, because a, something that wasn't a theorem prover, but was really a, just a proof checker, would have to start from the basic algorithms and would require enormously long proofs. So what we do is we decompose the proof uh, into pieces that uh, the largest pieces that we can that can then be proved by the theorem prover or the proof checker. And the, there's been a, a tremendous uh, improvement in proof checking or theorem proving in the last couple of decades, uh, driven by two things. First, by improved algorithms for theorem proving and for, for having the computer find the proof, and an enormous increase in speed in, uh, in computing power. And has that changed your view of you know, writing proofs? Well, to some extent, but I mean, recognize that what changed my view of the world was getting rescued from this field, uh, which has made progress, but not anything like uh, as much progress as I anticipated, and my presence wouldn't have made the difference. But in 1972, I got rescued by discovering cryptography, uh, which has made a great deal more progress in the last 50 years. So. Well, that is true. Uh, proving correctness of programs has, uh, has made very little progress in the sense that uh, there are, I mean, a, only a very tiny fraction of programmers who even know that the concept of proving the correct, of a uh, program correct is, uh, I mean, it, is it's possible. It's grown a lot, but it hasn't grown as fast as the body of program, right? You, you say you mm -hmm. want to write a program as far beyond your ability to prove as our 10-line programs were mm -hmm. 50 years ago. And actually, that leads in quite well to one of the questions. I'm going to paraphrase a bit. Uh, it's about uh, the widespread use of machine learning across applications and uh, having proofs within uh, things uh, created through machine learning, which I'm, I'm making a bit of a leap here because often machine learning uh, uh, comes out with results that you don't know how they got to that result. So uh, does that present challenges for actually proving things uh, that are created by machine learning and other neural nets? And well, that in itself does not uh, create a challenge or a problem because the way uh, some proof, uh, some theorem provers work is that you write a proof and in the, in the course of checking it, they not only say, yes, this theorem is true, but they actually create a proof in a lower level language, very closer to the axioms, that then gets checked by a simpler uh, theorem prover. So machine learning you know, would, would fit in wonderfully uh, by you know, sort of creating this proof by methods that you know, we don't understand at all, but that's fine if what they create with it is something that can then be checked by uh, the by a, a program. And my feeling is that this is, to my knowledge, this has not happened yet. This is not being applied in you know, real life theorem provers, but it's clearly going to happen soon, and it's a marvelous. Uh, field uh, for research, uh, for all you young researchers out there listening, there's a nice problem to work on. 
Well, I mean, there's an analogy here with you keep running theorem provers and proof checkers together, and I think you shouldn't. And roughly speaking, a theorem prover, you know, reaches out and does something, which can then be handed to something that is only a proof checker, that checks that that proof is correct. And you're saying the machine learning thing re reaches out and produces a program, and then you have the problem of verifying what it did. Oh, no, I'm not talking about verifying the programs created by the um, by machine learning. There's, I'm talking about proofs created by machine learning. Okay. We're, we're in, in really deep doo-doo in the world <laughs> because uh, machine learning has succeeded in solving problems that we don't understand how to solve. And it's done that by creating programs that we don't understand. <laughs> but we're in this situation where we want to depend on those programs, I mean, to drive our cars. And we're really depending on the correctness of these programs. And we don't know how to prove them correct because we don't understand what the programs are. And this is a fantastically, another fantastically important yeah. uh, mm -hmm. research problem, you know, more important than uh, even then having machines create proofs. But it's a much, much more difficult problem to solve. And I don't, I don't have any ideas of you know, how one will go about doing it. Okay, but there's an important point, which you were talking about one case where machines do something you don't know, necessarily know how they did it is machines create proofs. Now, the critical point is that unlike theorems, proofs are decidable. You, 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 there's a formal procedure in all interesting areas of mathematics. The class of theorems is not decidable. You can't just arbitrarily look at a statement and decide whether it's, whether there, and find a proof for it. But given a proof, it is decidable whether that proof is correct. No. And so there is some passage here toward something. The proof checker does something that's purely formal and can be guaranteed to succeed in what it's doing. Well, that's true in theory, but uh, in, the, in, the, in the world of theorem proving, I'm, more, I'm a pragmatist, I'm not a theoretician. And the problems in, in uh, proving the correctness of programs are, are ones of scale. Um, and part of them of scale. And the, even when you have uh, machine learning producing the, the proofs, they're not going to be producing them at the level of the axioms. They're going to be producing them at you know, as high a level as we can have you know, ex theorem provers that don't work by machine learning you know, do the checking. Okay, I, I now feel lost. I mean, I've, I'm away from this field, and I, I'm not aware of whether uh, theorem provers uh, or, or machine learning theorem provers prove theor produce theorems that aren't expressed formally. I, I sort of thought they did. Uh, I saw, you know, informal thinking among computers isn't, isn't as strong yet as we might hope it'll become. Well, I, I, and I may have confused the issue somewhat because when I stated the question, I think I shared, I shared that confusion. You know, whether uh, we're talking about uh, machine learning creating the proofs or create, it's not creating the axioms on which the programs are based. Uh, in the particular area of concurrency, uh, there's one problem that uh, and I think it underlies uh, proofs of correctness of programs as well. Uh, the way you prove uh, an important part of correctness of programs involves proving that they don't do anything wrong. The other part is proving that they actually do something. Uh, in ordinary, uh, anyone knows about program correctness, those two parts are called partial correctness and termination. But when you get to the concurrency, the, the properties that you're actually dealing with are much larger. 
But the fundamental idea of how you prove that a program doesn't do anything bad is an induction proof. Uh, you prove that uh, it never reaches a bad state by proving that uh, at each that there's some there's some formula that's true about the state, and you want to prove that that formula is true about every state. And the way you do it is you prove that it's true in the initial state, and that every step of the program leaves that formula true. And now, the problem is that the complexity of that formula increases enormously with the complexity of what you're trying of of the program. And in concurrency, I mean, you're trying to write proofs of concurrency, whether you're doing it by hand or by machine. A really difficult problem is finding that formula, and that's an area in which I think. Uh, machine learning can help, and and in fact, speaking to when I describe to engineers, you know how you write these proofs, I tell them you have to find that formula, and they basically sit there with a blank look on their face and say, "Gee, I mean, I have no idea how to go about finding that formula," and. I can't help them much because right now it's an art, and you know I've learned how to do it. You know, much like a woodworker, you know, a sculptor learns to you know to make sculptures. It's it's not something I could write down a you know a bunch of rules for, but it would be really nice if machine learning could help them to write that formula. Well, let me go back. To sort of my original vision of this, a little analysis of that vision. See, I thought at, the, at, at that time, circa 1970, late 60s, that what was wrong with programming was that it was sort of solitary. Unlike mathematics, which really has a whole lot of, you know, wind, cross cross discussion, cross culture, and one of the particular things, you know, people prove a new theorem and they go and present it in the seminar, and lots of people listen to it and pay attention to whether they can check details, and they send it to the journal, and the referees work through it in, in detail, in a way people don't referee in, in computer science journals these days. They sort of read it and see if it looks okay. Um, so I thought, bring that to, com to computing, to programming in particular, that people would have You'd organize your programs in such a way that you could explain them people to people. People would listen. People would write better versions of parts of the program, etc. Now, when you talk about proof of correctness, one of the critical things is what a proof that a program is correct is a proof that a program meets a specification. So, in the sort of famous simple case. If you have a square root routine, what you're proving is that the square of the output of that routine is the input. Right? So that's one one kind of case of this. Now, at that time, right, uh, I thought, well, of course, you know, it's going to be very complex to write the specifications for complex things, and. If we have a scheduler, a garbage collector, an operating system, a full compiler, all these things, you know, thousands or millions of lines of code, and they're very complicated, and writing a proper spec is going to be a huge <coughs> problem. I missed something that has appeared in the last few years to disturb me very much. There is a security protocol called WP2. Uh, used in Wi-Fi, and it was proven correct. I think that proof is in the standard, and it was broken. And what that means wasn't that the proof was wrong; it's that they proved the wrong theorem. In short, they had not drawn exactly the right 
specification for what they wanted. And in fact, the way in which it was broken is something that's been known for a very long time in cryptography, creates what's called a depth of two problem. If you have two different views of something, of which you were expected to have only one view, very frequently you can figure out the things that you're seeing the views of. So I'm, I'm less started out with no faith at all in proof of correctness, and I've come to feel the proof of correctness will not achieve what I originally imagined it would, because I, I said the proofs guarantee the programs meet the specs, but if even simple specs can't be gotten correct, I don't see how to have formal method for being sure your, your specs are right. Well, that's something that I've been working on since, uh, I guess, the 1980s, where I realized that when we were writing concurrent programs, concurrent algorithms, we were stating the correctness of the algorithm in terms of the concepts of the algorithms themselves. Think of it, or proving correctness of a program in terms of things that are in the program, program variables. But a, an algorithm or a program should be implementing something at a higher level. And how do you specify what it's supposed to do at a higher level? And then how do you prove that uh, it does it? And that's basically what I've been working on for the past 25, 30 years or so. And I've realized, fortunately, the specification should be written in math because math is the, the best language that we have for writing things precisely. I mean, it was developed over, the, over centuries in order to be uh, concise and precise. And so what I've done in essentially, essentially is developed a, a, a way of writing specifications, specifically of concurrent algorithms. And then the, uh, addressing the issue of how do you prove that what one, an algorithm implements this specification written in mathematics. And the way I realized is that the best way of doing that is to write your algorithm in mathematics. And I've developed a way of doing that. It's called, I um, mean, the, the logic is called TLA and the, the language for doing that is called TLA plus. But that is uh, essentially what it does. So I haven't solved the problem of making sure that specifications uh, are right but I think I have a way of allowing you to specify them precisely in a way that helps that. And also, just getting the people who write the specifications to think in terms of mathematics rather than in terms of programs helps their thinking and makes it less likely that they'll screw up in writing the specification. I'd like to bounce one of the questions off of you because it, you're, you're actually answering it inadvertently. Um, would you think it's useful to generate proofs in a format which can be much easier, much more easily understood by non-expert users? And it sounds like what you're saying is, is that it's not important that humans understand these, these proofs so much as, uh, as that they are well, in, in mathematics, I suppose, that they are, they are embedded into the program. Am I, am I putting that correctly? Uh, How much human understanding is necessary for the proofs? Well, currently, you know, to write a proof uh, you know, requires understanding. Uh, on the other hand, I actually uh, had some experience in writing a paper together with uh, Edsker Dijkstra, in which I discovered an algorithm which I thought 
I had a hunch was correct, but I didn't know for sure that was correct. And using this particular method of writing uh, proofs of algorithms, and at that time it was being done by hand, but it made the proof done in such a way that you could break it into small enough pieces and convince yourself that each piece was correct because it was a very simple mathematical statement. And then if all those pieces are correct, you knew that uh, the, the algorithm satisfied that correctness property. And I did that and I succeeded in proving the correctness of this algorithm and I still didn't understand it. <laughs> that is, I could not write a proof that people could understand. Now, this is not generally the way things work, <laughs> but it does sort of indicate, you know, the power of, of rigorous mathematical thinking that, uh, you know, as a supplement to understanding. But in, in, in most cases, when you write a proof, you have to understand the proof at a high level in order to, you know, to write it. And I would say that if you write proofs hierarchically, the way I, uh, I've given lectures at, at the Heidelberg Forum about how you should write those proofs, that you can write them precisely at a high enough level that people can understand them, and then you can decompose those steps into more complicated things that people don't really want to, to look at, these, these details of how you go about proving those mathematical statements. But you can do that so that you can then get it at a lower enough level that the math becomes simple enough that you can be very confident that it's correct. But again, that's still proving the, that you know, an algorithm implements a specification that still doesn't solve the problem of getting the specification right. Well, in the late 70s and early 80s, this, was, this program was popular with the Department of Defense, and they adopted a four-level system in which you had a sort of a formal, you know, like legal writing English specification, and then you had what's called a high-level formal specification and a low-level formal specification and the code. And they got to be fairly good at proving the low-level specification met the high-level specification. There's no pure way of formalizing the agreement between the English specification and the high-level one. But even doing that, never got very good at proving the code met the low-level specification. Hmm. Another question that we have is, um, let me see if I can find it again. Um, Oh, it was on a little bit earlier. Um, are, there, are there algorithms that resist proving or that don't need to be proven? <laughs> I like the first part of that. Although lots of them resist proving. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, that maybe is a foregone conclusion. But <laughs> I mean, the only sense I can make of don't need to be proven is that you have something... So just so simple. Everybody, everybody agrees it's obvious. I mean, it's sort of like, sort of like the axioms or something of that kind. Um, well, a lot of programs or a lot of algorithms uh, resist proving because they're incorrect. Uh, <laughs> uh, on the other hand, that doesn't keep some people from proving them. <laughs> but uh, you know. I have a, uh, my empirical advice is to, I guess it comes to the question of how simple this is a, a piece of a mathematical statement that you can trust it as being true without having to prove it. And that is a very important question when you're writing proofs hierarchically. The question is, how far down do you have to, sp to, to split it? And my advice is to split it down to the level where you think it is absolutely, completely obvious, and then go another one or two levels. <laughs> What strikes me is even about mathematics, 
Um, the uh, Euclidean geometry looks reasonably clear, but when Hilbert and other people formalized it in the late 19th century, they discovered that there were new concepts to, that you had, like lies between, was not discussed in, Hilbert's, in Euclid's axioms, and that were necessary to have proper formal proofs. Oh, that's a wonderful illustration of that. If you go online, look up a proof that all triangles are isosceles. Now, I came across that, pro that proof in a book when I was in high school. And I realized that you could not believe a single proof that you wrote in your you know, high school plane geometry class. None of them are rigorous. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, I also learned when I was a graduate student that it is possible to make some real mathematics, the kind of math that, you know, subjects like analysis uh, or you know, elementary calculus, for example, something that can be made without much effort into something that is really completely rigorous. I have, a, I have a list of questions. I could go down and, and, uh, and you can pick the ones you want. We only have about three and a half minutes left, so perhaps a better use of time might be to, uh, uh, to see if you have any, any final thoughts that perhaps uh, something came up, then we turned away from it, or you were sorry something didn't come up. And I had one little point that I wanted to mention that my sense is that a lot, a lot of things, a lot of theorems that have correct proofs are not the right theorem in another sense than the one I mentioned earlier, which is we're talking in all of this about applied mathematics, right? We're trying to get something done. We're trying to get programs to run correctly. And so there's a theorem proved by one of my advisors, James Massey, and a student of his named... Uh, eh student of his. Um, that guy will be mad at me if he ever hears this. Uh, but it proves that if you doubly encrypt something, uh, only the first encryption matters. And the theorem's clearly correct, and yet the assumptions, the, 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 the crypto systems involved, each one is what's called absolute... Uh, I think absolutely secure, sort of Shannon notion, unconditionally secure, and yet the, in the composition, the first one basically moves the data out of where the second one operates. So the second one can't do anything to change the situation. And, you know, that's just not how the crypto systems, anybody who actually uses cryptography, uh, use work. And in particular, one of the biggest practical things that's done in the world is that you have networks and the networks may, may have some encryption on them and then they pass through at a higher level, everything is super encrypted, mm -hmm. right? And that they have a theorem saying that that doesn't work and for obvious reasons it doesn't create the distress that it might because pretty clearly the theorem doesn't really apply to the normal sort of crypto systems. Well, Uli Maurer. I think I can close with observing that uh, we don't prove correctness of systems. We prove correctness of models of systems. And as someone said, once said, no model is correct. Some models are useful. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure and an honor. And now we're going to go to a recap of the day's events. Uh, so stay tuned and keep enjoying the 8th Heidelberg Laureate Forum. <laughs>